supposed to get, okay? So nothing's going to happen with whatever the grade said. If you got, if you did it all and the grade said you got a 40 or something like that, it's no big deal. We'll make sure that it's all taken care of, I promise you, okay? So um, I know you guys got a lot to worry about without having to worry about all that, and it was my fault, apparently, and I apologize for that. So um, just to let everybody know, there is a mishap with the grading of L2. I'll figure it out and um, we'll get it all straightened out, okay? Um, so other than that, quiz uh, two um, was passed back today. If you didn't get it, like I said, you can come, come up and get it after class. Um, there's a, the key up here for quiz two if you're wondering why you got anything wrong. First thing I would do uh, is add up the points that I took off. And if it's different than what um, the grade says, make sure you come and bring it up to me because I have obviously been known to make errors in grading, okay? So um, that being said, uh, I guess I'm just getting rid of my scooter. I wanted to finish up uh, chapter three. I know we kind of sped through it at the end.
Okay, and those are the ones I want you to be familiar with. The ammonium, nitrate, sulfate, hydroxide, cyanide, phosphate, carbonate, bicarbonate, and acetate. Um, yeah, I don't think any of the other ones. If we use any of the other ones, I'll specifically tell you that what their names are, okay? Uh, but I definitely want, want you to know if I were to give you one of the other ones, you could identify it as a polyatomic ion. Okay, so if I gave you MnO4 minus, you could say that's a polyatomic ion instead of a monatomic ion. Okay, but I wouldn't expect you to remember that it's the permanganate ion. It's got a negative one charge and so on. Okay, and here's just some, another list of polyatomic ions. It again uh, states some things about polyatomic ions. So you can think of polyatomic ions as charged molecules. Okay, so a molecule consists of more than one atom, or uh, in this case, it'd be like a charged compound, right? A compound consists of more than one type of atom. Um, polyatomic ions are covalently bonded, the atoms within the polyatomic ion are covalently bonded to one another. So what we're gonna learn today is that these lines represent, uh, hopefully we'll learn today, we might not get to it, but these lines represent the chemical bond, okay, between these two atoms. And we kind of started talking about this in lab last week, about bonds, breaking bonds, making bonds, and that type of stuff. But um, those lines in between those atoms represent bonds. So um, if we believe that, then we can say, well, these uh, polyatomic ion atoms are covalently bond to one another, but the overall particle has a positive charge. So it's an ion, okay? So even though you've got covalent bonds in it, right, it's an ion, and it, the whole thing will form ionic bonds, okay? So if I got these two guys together, what we would actually form is NH4, because it's got, so it's got a positive one charge, and it's got a negative one charge, so those will cancel out. So we got NH4Br, so this would be the, formula unit of these two combining, okay? So this, this name of this compound is ammonium bromide, and we'll get to that in a sec. But, so if you look, this compound here, or this um, ionic substance, right, this salt, has both um, covalent bonds within it, and the cation, it has covalent bonds, and between the cation and anion has ionic bonds. So it's got both types of bonds in it, okay? So, um, okay, so here's some common, we can get to it, common metal polyatomic ion compounds. Um, calcium hydroxide, OH minus is hydroxide. How do we know it's OH minus? Because we know calcium is two plus. And if we've got a formula like that, we say, well, calcium is two plus. Then since we have two of those OH things, then they both must be minuses to cancel it out. Okay? So this is how you actually will predict the if you don't know the charges inherently on these polyatomic ions, which I strongly urge you to memorize, you know, but there might be on a test something that you forget or something like that. You can go back to what you know about the main group elements and uh, um, infer, if you will, what the uh, charge on the polyatomic ion is, okay? So uh, some other ones, strontium nitrate, uh, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, uh, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, these are all uh, common uh, compounds that you find, um, I don't know, uh, normally every day. So antacids, baking sodas, bleach, so on. Uh, so here's uh, another picture of some ionic compounds. Uh, most of these have uh, polyatomic ions associated with them. So the cobalt nitrate, cobalt-2 nitrate is this red solution. 
uh, potassium dichromate, of course, is the orange solution. Uh, cobalt 2 sulfate is this blue solution over here, and potassium permanganate uh, as well. Yeah, potassium permanganate is that purple solution. Okay, okay so um, to name these compounds, I know that you guys haven't memorized the polyatomic ions yet, but uh, to name these, you will have to uh, know all of those polyatomic ions. So this one, of course, would be ammonium chloride, barium sulfate, um, iron 3 nitrate, uh, copper 1 bicarbonate, and calcium hydroxide. Okay. So notice I was putting the, um, for the iron and the copper, I was putting the Roman numeral in the name. Okay, you have to do that with transition metals. Um, again, writing the formulas for ionic compounds, we know how to do that. Okay, let's look at uh, ionic bonding um, strength. Uh, what you find is there's another periodic trend here, kind of. Uh, if you've got uh, large ions that have a uh, 1 plus and a 1 minus charge, right? these are not going to be attracted as e to each other as if you have uh, smaller ions that have um, a full positive 1, positive, or negative 1 charge. And the, the reason is because if you think about these two spheres, so let's look at, um, so we can say this is a monatomic ion and this is another monatomic ion. Okay, this would be like comparing, um, I don't know, rubidium, and lithium, we'll say. Okay, what you find, what you find is that lithium is a very much smaller um, ion. So this would be, sorry. Lithium is a very much smaller ion than rubidium due to its placement on the periodic table, but they both have the same amount of charge, one plus, okay? so. Rubidium can actually spread that charge out, and what we'll say is delta plus, okay, delta, so that means partial positive, okay? So this thing can spread its charge out all the way across its surface, yeah. And so can this one, it can do it too. But of course, it's got a smaller surface to do that. So if you were to think about it in a different way, how many little delta positives could you write on the surface of each one of these things? Okay, of course you could write more on this one than you could on this one due to the fact that this is larger. Okay, does everybody get that? Okay, so what happens is, or What's the case is that atoms don't like to be uh, charged in general, okay? They do it to get more stable, but even, even though they're getting more stable, they're still not like completely stable because they've got this positive or negative charge on them and they don't like it, okay? So, which is the reason why they form ionic compounds, okay? So rubidium or lithium, they don't like to have this positive charge so if they see some chlorine over here, they'll stick to it. So it'll cancel out that positive and negative charge, okay? So what you find is that when you've got two real small ions, of course, with the same charge, and compare them to two real big ions with the same charge, what'll happen is that these two, so, so this is negative, 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 negative. These guys will be very much attracted to each other. These guys will be less so because they don't mind having that charge distributed about their 
surface area as much as these guys do. They still don't like it, so they'll still be attracted to each other. They just won't have as much strength or force of attraction as these guys do. Does that make sense? Because these ones are small. Okay. And then, of course, when you increase the charge amount, right, so if you don't increase the size of it and then increase the charge, then it makes it even, you know, crazier. It's like, okay, so um, instead of lithium, we'll do beryllium. So beryllium 2 plus really can't stand it because it's got two pluses on it, right? And it's got to distribute amongst the same, same amount of surface area. So if you find, like, oxygen 2 minus, compare, or um, uh, put it in the presence of a beryllium uh, 2 plus, they'll really stick together because they're both so small, okay? And then, of course, when you get bigger 2 plus, of course, the attraction isn't as much. And you can see that by looking at the uh, melting points of these different uh, compounds. So lithium fluoride or lithium oxide, the melting point um, of lithium oxide is much uh, bigger or higher than the melting point of lithium fluoride. Why is that? Because oxide has the two minus charge and fluoride only has the one minus charge. Okay. And then if you look at calcium uh, sulfide compared to uh, potassium sulfide, again, it's the same sort of instance where the, so they're about the same size, calcium and potassium, right? But look at the difference in melting point. It's fairly dramatic. It's due to the fact that calcium has a 2 plus and sulfur has a 2 plus, whereas uh, potassium only has a 1 plus and sulfur has a 2 minus. Okay, so covalent bonding, um, we talked about covalent bonding. Um, but again, it was, uh, we went through it kind of fast, so uh, I didn't do it on the test. Um, covalent compounds form from sharing electrons between one atom and another, so they don't transfer their electrons, like we talked about with ionic compounds. So they typically form when two or no more non-metals react. Um, we'll, we'll show more about this, uh, this next statement in the next set of slides, but the bond results from the electrostatic attraction between the nucleus of one atom and the electrons of the other atom. Uh, covalent compounds ex exist as discrete molecules that behave as individual particles, as opposed to um, the kind of uh, extensive networks that ionic compounds result in, um, like we were showing last. So you can see the polyatom here with the monoatoms there, monoatomic ions. And you can compare that to just a ionic compound that has two monoatomic ions. So you can hopefully see the difference between those. Um, and then hopefully also see the difference between these and this, right? This is just one little particle, right? As opposed to same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. Let's, let's show another uh, covalent compound. If I can find one in here. discrete individual particles relative to whole conglomerate of things. So 
very small, but very startling. Okay. So, um, when we name covalent compounds, usually this only applies. I know you're going to start wanting to name like very, very long covalent compounds, but this usually only applies to when you're talking about covalent compounds consisting of two different types of atoms. Okay. So. Um, you can start naming covalent compounds, but don't try to name them if they've got more than two types of atoms because they, they'll, they have a different name. They won't be named like this. But if they do have two, only two different types of atoms in them, what you can find is that you can name them. So the names of the elements are written in the order which they appear in the formula. Usually they're written with the... Um, atomic number of the first atom being less than the atomic uh, atomic number of the second atom, but that's not always the case as you can see. You know, it's not always the case. It's written, they're all written very strangely. But um, if you see them, if you see the formula written like this, you're going to want to name it in the same way that the formula is written. Okay, so there's not really a rhyme or reason the way that they're, they are written. You can kind of say this may be the case that uh, the, the least, um, well, we haven't learned really about electronegativity yet, but you could say the least electronegative is named first, but it, again, it's not always the case. But what I would always do is, like, if I get something like this, SO2, what you're going to want to name it is the first atom first and then the second atom second, no matter what, okay? So um, this compound, SO2, is called sulfur dioxide because it's only got one sulfur atom. And normally you want to put a prefix in front of every everything except if the first atom only has one um, unit to it, okay? So in the case of sulfur dioxide or carbon monoxide, since the first atom only has one, you don't put the mono. Okay. So the prefix indicates the number of each type of atom. If only one atom of a particular element is present, the prefix mono is usually omitted from the first element, and the stem of the last element is used uh, is changed to IDE. So um, you can see nitrogen triiodide. Um, not mononitrogen triiodide. Uh, notice this one has four uh, phosphoruses in the first atom that's listed, so we call it tetraphosphorus, and five oxygen pentoxide. These uh, names, these prefixes, you'll have to remember because they'll be used very commonly, so um, most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, if there's any you have any trouble with remembering, maybe I can help you thinking of something that uh, reminds you of, I don't know, like octo and deoxygen. So uh, these are some very common covalent compounds. Notice uh, they are all just like this, kind of just an individual particle, not a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of atoms stuck together. Okay. So notice this one only consists of three atoms. This one consists of five atoms, this one four, this one three, okay? Instead of a million, okay? So if you want to try to name these compounds, maybe we can by now. Um, what do you think about this one? What is this one called here? Silicon, silicon dioxide, right? SI is silicon, for those of you who didn't know. Um, what about this one? Dinitrogen pentoxide. Pentoxide. So no, you didn't notice you didn't say pentaoxide. It's because uh, the A and the O don't go together. So whenever you have O, like oxygen, uh, cut off the A of any one of your prefixes. Okay. What about this one? Carbon tetrafluoride. Carbon tetrafluoride. Okay. Um, and that one? Iodine, Iodine, Iodine heptafluoride. Yeah. What about this one? This one. This. One. <laughs> well, no one wants to do that name. Okay. So I guess you guys kind of got it. Um, try some more. Um, try to. Try to write the names of the formulas of these things. What would be the formula of this? 
0.205, right? And then you could probably do that last time. Okay, um, we're going to go over this stuff at the end of next chapter, so I'm not going to go over it right now. Okay. of these particular bonds that uh, come together to make to form these different uh, types of compounds, covalent and ionic. Okay, and in fact, all the other types of forms that there are between particles. The main ones we're going to focus on are covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Okay, so how are atoms held together? So remember, I, I showed you that picture earlier. Um, here's another demonstration of atoms being held together, right? So if we think of this as being a hydrogen atom and this being a carbon atom and this being some other type of atom, I don't know. Uh, what we can do is stick this carbon atom to this hydrogen atom by putting this little gray thing in between them. So I guess I, okay. So this carbon atom. So this carbon atom and this hydrogen atom, right? We can stick this little gray thing here in between them. We call this thing a bond, okay? And that kind of like sticks these two atoms together. Like that, okay? So you can kind of think of bonds like glue for atoms, okay? So they'll stick the two atoms together. So uh, the more official definition is the force of attraction between two, any two atoms in a compound. So this attractive force overcomes the repulsion of the positively charged nuclei. So of course, both of these nuclei here are positively charged, right? And then they come to really close together, positive and positive, they repel each other, right? But the bond can overcome that uh, repulsion. Um, yeah, and interaction, and these bonds are just interactions of valence electrons between the two different two elements that are uh, composed in the bond, okay? So um, we need to remember that valence electrons uh, describe the chemical reactivity of any atom, okay? So it's only the valence electrons. That's why we had all that um, work on learning valence electrons and uh, noble gas configurations and all of that goes on. So it's going to come into play now. Okay, so remember the noble gas configuration. Uh, if we look at an element, it's conventional or expanded electron uh, uh, configuration is uh, for lithium, for example, would be 1s2, 2s1, and then the abbreviated um, form would be just showing the noble gas plus the valence electron. Okay, so when you look at this, this really does emphasize how many valence electrons lithium has. But this, again, is kind of a cumbersome way to think about it when you're trying to stick atoms together, okay? So, uh, but we do want to emphasize that it's the noble gas configuration and the valence electrons that really pushes all of this reactivity upon these different elements, okay? So instead of representing it like electron configurations, like we've been known to do in the past, for the past two weeks we've been doing, let's uh, go back backwards and just look, since we know valence electrons now, we can just look at the periodic table, and instead of writing all that electron configuration business, we'll just write dots that represent the valence electrons. And I kind of alluded to this last Wednesday, but what you'll find is that you can represent these atoms plus their valence electron just through um, the atomic symbol and dot. So remember, we said Li, we could uh, we could write as um, 1s2, 2s1, or we could write it as helium, 2s1, or we could represent it much easier, more concisely.
precisely as lithium plus one valence electron. Okay? So that dot represents its one valence electron. And what you'll see is if you look at this uh, kind of makeshift periodic table here, you can see as you go up and through, right, you get one more valence electron, one more dot added to you until you get to the neon or argon configuration, that's the noble gas configuration, they're stable because they have eight electrons around them. Okay. So uh, this representation of these dots and the atomic symbol is known as the Lewis structure, named after some guy named Lewis, okay, long since dead guy. Um, as with only uh, valence, or since only valence electrons participating in <coughs> participate in bonding, it makes uh, much easier to work with the octet rule, of course, than to, especially if you're looking at, you know, I don't know, selenium or something like that. You don't want to have all these numbers and letters written out. You can just put the atom, put some dots around it, and say you're finished, okay? So remember the number of dots directly corresponds to the number of valence shells uh, that each atom has. Um, so how do we represent these? Uh, you put the atomic symbol, you place one dot uh, around the symbol until there are four dots. So this is the way a lot of people like to do it. So for lithium, so let's do boron, for example. We would start here, put one, two, well, three, like that, so we're going around the atom. Carbon. One, two, three, four. Then nitrogen would be one, two, three, four, and then five, like that. Okay, so it would have what we call a pair of electrons and three unpaired electrons. Okay, so this is the way you want to start drawing your uh, Lewis structures. Just one dot, one dot, one dot, one dot, until you get to four. Then you put the next dot with the first dot, okay? Remember, two electrons, it's okay to have two electrons. Okay, um, yeah, and each unpaired dot, so like in nitrogen here, it's got one, two, three unpaired dots, right? Each unpaired dot is available to form a chemical bond, okay? So if we look here, lithiums, only got one unpaired dot. And in fact, lithium only participates in ionic bonds. And this is really going to apply mostly to covalent bonds. So you're going to want to really concentrate on the non-metals up here. Okay? You can still represent what's going on with ionic bonds, and we're going to a lot, but it real, Lewis structures really help you with covalent a lot more. Again, notice the Lewis dot structure of all of the uh, group one elements here are all the same. It would, it would be the same for all the group two elements, the same for all the group three elements, so on and so forth. And here's a good representation of that. So notice transition metals. Again, they're so they're very strange. So we only really want to concentrate on the main group stuff. Okay. And again, um, all of the metals. So uh, remember, an ionic bond is a transfer of one or more electrons from one atom to another. Okay, so let's form an ionic bond. So one thing, or let's draw, so we've drawn the Lewis structure of uh, lithium here. Let's draw the Lewis structure of chlorine. How many dots? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots, right? So how do we draw that? We go one, two, three, four, and then now we've got one on each side, so we're going to jump back to there. Five, six, seven. Notice we've got three paired electrons. These paired electrons, I'm going to start calling them lone pair electrons. Okay, 
because that's what I always call them. They're called lone pair electrons. So anything that's paired up like this, this is called a lone pair of electrons. And then these guys, these are unpaired electrons. So lone pair electrons are not used in bonding. So there's kind of these three steps to it. The transfer of electrons, forming of the ions, and then sticking together of the two oppositely charged ions. That's how you make an ionic bond. If you go back to the practice test that I gave you, uh, number five on the practice test is essentially doing this thing um, with uh, I don't remember what it was, oxygen and iodine, I think. But actually, in that case, we were talking about covalent ones. Okay? So this is different. So I do have a couple more minutes here. Uh, this is different than forming a covalent bond. So notice this is the transfer of electrons. A covalent bond is due to the sharing of electrons. Okay? So uh, let's draw. Hopefully we get. Okay, so... Let's just go over again ionic, what I talked about in ionic bonds, and once we finish the ionic bonds, then you guys can go. So ion formation takes place by electron transfer. You can see the, tra the transfer of the electrons, so the sodium plus the electron, the electron then goes to chlorine. 
forming the full octet here. So both of them gain the noble gas configuration, and then they stick together. Again, here's another representation of it. But notice you don't have just two atoms sticking together. You've got this whole conglomerate here. Okay, you see that? So ionic bond forms between simple ions. When representative elements lose valence electrons, the electrons are gained by other representative non-emetal atoms. Both atoms are changed into ions with noble gas configurations, and the resulting ions are attracted to each other, sticking, sticking together, okay, to form this conglomerate. And then you can see the arrangement in the crystals, if you want. And then you can see, remember, ionic charges. Okay, so we'll stop there. We'll stop there for right now. So remember all of that stuff. That's kind of the review from last Wednesday. Um, and next time we'll start with electronegativity and do some basic bonding. That'll probably take up most of next week. Didn't get your